Today, we're going to continue discussing the traces of tooling found on artifacts from ancient Egypt. First, we will examine an object located within the remains of the so-called Headless Pyramid. As for the age of this thing, there is no unified consensus on its dating. Estimates place its construction anywhere within a span of seven centuries, from the 5th to the 12th dynasty. That means we aren't even sure if this pyramid was constructed during the Old or the Middle Kingdom. There are two theories as to why it looks this way. One, it was never completed for some reason, and two, that it was intentionally dismantled. Despite that, the few surviving blocks can still tell us a great deal. Let's start by taking a look at an artifact consisting of the broken main body of a stone box and a well-preserved lid. Unfortunately, the site is in poor condition due to garbage and various debris being dumped there over the years. It pains me to see the results of such immense human effort, artistic and architectural creations, the legacy of a remarkable past civilization treated this way. So I'll edit out the garbage in the footage without affecting the subject of study so we can get a better look at things. The general dimensions of the lid can be seen in the photo. I've marked the approximate values in a different color. Judging by its size and density, it weighs roughly around two tons. The lock mechanism is clearly visible and was designed to protect the contents by making unauthorized access difficult. A similar locking system was used in the stone box in the pyramid attributed to Khafre. After the lid was slid into place, rods would fall into corresponding holes in the base, preventing the lid from being pushed back and the sarcophagus from being opened. This raises several questions regarding the reliability of such a system. The issue is that, when closed, the lid leaves a seam or even a slight gap around its perimeter at the back. Using wedges, one could, with enough effort and persistence, break either the lid or the locking section. Yet, for some reason, looters did not use this method and instead preferred to smash the lid more often, or the box, as in this case. One possible reason for this might be that the already sealed box was placed tightly against a wall, making the rear side, where the rods were located, inaccessible. However, access to the back isn't necessary to use wedges. In Khafre's pyramid, it is believed that although the box was set into the floor, which added another layer of difficulty to opening it, there was still a gap between it and the wall that allowed the lid to be slid into place after the installation. Therefore, there was access to the rear side. Another aspect worth considering is how precisely the receiving and locking parts of the mechanism aligned. Measurements of this show that the height on one side differs by three millimeters, which corresponds well with the overall precision typical of the workmanship from this period. High precision isn't demonstrated on everything from this period, only on select artifacts, and that is a special topic of its own. In general, surface imperfections are almost always present. In the case of a locking mechanism, a gap of several millimeters is not only expected, but necessary. I don't think the lid could have been slid into place with extremely tight tolerances. It would have jammed with even the slightest misalignment especially considering the weight and the fact that the surfaces were not polished, which would only have increased friction. Even pre-treating the locking parts with a lubricant, like a fad of some kind, would not have made any notable difference. After the lid was installed, scratch marks may have remained on the locking surfaces, but those types of scratches are hard to distinguish from marks left during manufacturing, as they may follow the same direction. Given the precision of the locks, we can assume that, once closed, a gap of at least 1-2 to two millimeters remained, enough to be revealed by wedging. This would allow not only the detection of the rod locations, but also the possibility of manipulating them. Even if resin was used and preheated rods were inserted into it to secure them in place, preventing them from falling out if the box was overturned, there were still ways to intervene. It's important to remember that in ancient Egypt, people knew how to work with fire. Such knowledge was required not only for metallurgy, but also for creating lamps with minimal soot output. Since many operations were carried out underground and in long corridors, Inefficient combustion would have made breathing difficult and coated all the walls in soot, though we do not have any firm evidence of soot marks in most of the underground and dark portions of the most impressive megalithic architecture. Therefore, by fully wedging the lid open with wooden wedges, the rods could have been heated and pulled out, even if resin was used, especially if the box was tilted or turned over. Additionally, the openings opposite the rods could have been widened to make manipulation easier. Furthermore, if the ancients had sufficiently thin and hard tools with fixed abrasives, the rods could have been sawed through. This is because the hardness of bronze on the Vicar scale is five times lower than that of quartz, and ten times lower than that of corundum. And if they were capable of cutting granite, they could certainly have cut through bronze. Of course, this would require a number of conditions to ensure the proper use of the tool, but the possibility itself certainly existed. Moreover, it wouldn't have been necessary to cut all the way through the rods. Just making notches would suffice. 
Then a blow to the lid could break the rods at those points. Therefore, given enough time, the box could have been opened almost intact. Perhaps that's exactly what happened with the stone box in Coffrey's Pyramid, the state of preservation of which is quite remarkable. If you're sharp, you may easily guess who opened it. Naturally, looters had no reason to preserve stone sarcophagi or waste time on careful, damage-free break-ins. And in the case of the so-called Headless Pyramid, it seems that they acted just like that. The box was brutally smashed. This is surprising, considering that the wall thickness was around 25 centimeters. What kind of force would be required to break it, and why was it shattered into such small pieces when making a single breach would have sufficed? We could expect them to go for the lid, as it would have been the easiest and therefore preferred point of entry. The answer lies in the fact that the stone used was not basalt, as some sources claim, but gray sandstone. This was confirmed through analysis conducted by the ISIDA project, and the results are published on their website. The link is in the description. Only in its metamorphosed form, when it turns into quartzite, does sandstone become durable, as it is predominantly composed of quartz at that point. In its usual form, however, it is a relatively brittle material. Many ancient architectural structures were made from it, such as the dolmens of the Caucasus or the pyramids and temples of Cambodia. Such a box could not offer a high level of protection, so it's not surprising that the chest was broken into such small fragments. For some reason, the lid was left intact. It's clear that this was done intentionally. The most straightforward explanation is that, due to its slab-like shape, it could have been easily repurposed. Since the pyramid was dismantled for building materials, the lid may also have been intended for reuse as a construction block. As you can see, only the irregular corner pieces of the chest remain. Flat fragments were most likely reused in another construction project. By some fortunate coincidence, the lid was neither taken nor destroyed, and it has survived in almost perfect condition. This allows us to study the tool marks left on its surface during manufacturing. But before that, I'd like to pause and consider its form and the choice of material. If we assume that the box was intended to serve as the final line of defense for the pharaoh's mummy, though no mummies were ever found, then it should have been as reinforced as possible. Djoser attempted something like this, essentially constructing a bunker from granite blocks. The problem of reinforcement could be solved quite easily. Embed the box in the floor, surround it with granite blocks, then slide a megalithic granite slab down a ramp and dismantle the ramp afterward. Additionally, a locking protrusion could be added to prevent the slab from being shifted. There are many similar engineering solutions one could come up with, yet neither the boxes and obvious sarcophagi nor the pyramids themselves were ever properly protected. This presents us with a contradiction. The engineering and architectural knowledge clearly existed to build such complex structures, yet the most basic protective measures were never implemented. As for the shape of the sarcophagus, its evolution is rather vague. There wasn't a strict progression from one form to another. The contoured lid shape can be seen in one of the earliest known sarcophagi, from Mastaba 17. Its upper part was built using leftover materials from the construction of the Maidum Pyramid. The lid has no locking grooves, and to move it, looters needed nothing more than a simple acacia stick sharpened at one end. Interestingly, this sarcophagus was not empty. A mummy was found inside. By contrast, the box in the Pyramid of Khafre, officially dated later, has a flat lid, but this time with locking grooves. One striking feature is the asymmetry of the curved upper surface. On one side, there's a small step, while the other side is smooth. This is a very odd trace, and it's hard to find a rational explanation for it. At first glance, it appears as though there was a miscalculation in the radius while forming the curved shape, resulting in a level difference. But this seems unlikely. Alternatively, it might be the result of an unfinished process, where material was being removed in thick layers. However, it might also have been an intentional decorative element, though this is unusual for sarcophagi and for ancient Egyptian art in general, where there is a strong tendency towards symmetry. As of yet, there is no clear explanation for the stepped offset on the curved surface. The choice of stone is also surprising. Sandstone was not commonly used in the earliest examples. This suggests that what we see might have been more of an attempt to perfectly reproduce a known shape, but using a different material. At the same time, the tool marks generally resemble those found on granite artifacts, which strongly suggests that the same types of tools and techniques were used across different types of stone. Now, let's examine the tool traces. There were quite a few, both in the lid and on the broken fragments of the chest, mostly in the form of familiar grooves. It can be assumed that most of the work was done using saws. A deep cut visible in the locking section clearly shows an overcut which is important because it allows us to estimate the width of the saw blade near its base, about 3 millimeters. Some relatively hard to reach surface areas are rough, indicating that chiseling rather than sawing was used in those spots. These areas were never fully ground or polished. Exactly the same approach can be seen on the unfinished box in the Cairo Museum. One of the comments drew my attention to this detail, and I'd like to express my gratitude for that. 
Your observations add to our knowledge and deepen our understanding of how stone was worked in antiquity. Thank you. It's clearly visible that the surface of the unfinished lid is rough, while the rest is leveled. As a result of polishing, the surface level was significantly lowered. If one places a ruler at an angle, the process surface might appear as if the stone had been pushed outward. But in reality, this effect was created by the removal of material during the leveling process. Thus, both in granite and in the more workable sandstone, a method was commonly used where the surface was initially left rough and required subsequent refinement. The scratches are not as pronounced as on granite. Likely, they were partially smoothed out, making them harder to detect. In some cases, dust settling on the raised portions of the surface helps reveal these marks. On the flat surfaces, curved saw marks are noticeable. These do not follow a constant radius, which means such marks were not made by massive circular saws. Instead, as discussed in other videos, they were likely produced by a pendulum-like motion of the saw, possibly with a fixed or semi-fixed mount. It has sometimes been suggested that these traces could result from layer-by-layer -layer removal of material using a tool similar to a plane, either with a rotating abrasive drum or a flat blade. A rotating drum is harder to implement and tends to leave distinctive tracks in the form of bands or localized depressions. Therefore, it seems more likely that a simple abrasive block was used. But this raises the question, is such a tool suitable for removing granite in layers rather than just for polishing? We can't be certain, but the scratches seem to run along the entire length of the process surfaces. This implies continuous motion of the tool, possibly due to its size or the use of additional guiding elements such as rails or brackets. It should also be noted that the planes and angles of the artifact only appear perfect at first glance. In fact, the surfaces are not flawless. There are deviations from flatness and noticeable imperfections in right angles. In the drilled holes, about 5 cm in diameter and 9 cm deep, the irregularity of the scratches is clearly visible. The same irregularity is observed in other types of stone as well. The scratches themselves are deeper than those on granite, which implies their characteristics likely depend on the hardness of the material being worked. As a result, thanks to this sandstone artifact and other objects bearing tool marks on granite and basalt, it becomes possible to conduct experiments on various types of stone. The subsequent analysis of results can help identify similarities and differences between modern reconstructions and ancient tool marks. In this way, we can establish clear principles of stone working in ancient Egypt, and possibly in other regions as well. The traces on sandstone are particularly suitable for replication since, unlike granite, it is a softer material and requires much less effort to work. This opens up broader opportunities for experimentation. It should also be noted that the exact strength of this specific type, gray sandstone, remains unknown. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.